All right, today's uh, presentation format will be 44 slides, and I do welcome brief questions during the presentation, and you can raise your hand and Mark will alert me, and at the end we'll take questions and answers. So the learning objectives for today are why birds don't see glass, lights out programs, and lead requirements for bird collision deterrent. So why all the fuss? Sure, birds have collisions with buildings, but are there really that many fatalities? As we'll see, 100 million per year in the U.S., enough concern for building designers and owners to warrant USGBC to initiate a lead pilot credit 55 bird collision deterrence. We'll start with the problem, why birds don't see glass, review the most important deterrent, lights out programs, and review in detail what this credit is about and how to meet the requirements to achieve the credit, including specifying bird legible pattern glass. So most likely, two out of 10 of you designs and specifiers out there are birders. There are 48 million birders in the U.S., uh, about 21% of the population, and uh, this was taken from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service report uh, not too long ago, so it's still relevant. And what constitutes a birder? Uh, if you take a trip uh, at least a mile away from your home to observe birds, you're a birder, or if you closely observe birds around your home, then you're classified as a birder. We went through the learning objectives, and here's a, a U.S. map just showing the demographics of birders. The, the south tend to be higher, probably because they have nicer weather, and same with the Midwest. And the west and northeast is about the same. The state of Massachusetts, where I'm from, is around 24%. So I'm going to use this as an example. <clears throat> this is the worst case scenario here. We have this um, World Trade Center in Bakran, and it's in a V-shape. The site plan is in a V-shape. So those two buildings that uh, imitate sails are, are designed to uh, come to an apex. And in the middle of that apex, you have these wind turbines. So this is a, a double whammy for birds. Uh, as you'll see, when those lights are on at nighttime, as there's any migrating birds through this area, they'd be attracted by the lights of the buildings, and then they would get sucked into these wind turbines, which would be definitely fatal. So we're going to go through why birds don't see glass first. Uh, most of these references come from uh, Bird Safe Building Guidelines from New York City Audubon. Uh, the first topic we'll discuss is reflection, the mirror effect. Uh, from outside most buildings, glass often appears highly reflective, increasingly so when seen from an op oblique angle. Almost every type of artificial glass under the right conditions reflect the sky, clouds, or nearby trees and vegetation reproducing habitat familiar with and attractive to birds. The second uh, major cause of collision is transparency, the so-called fly-through effect. During daylight hours, birds strike transparent windows as they attempt to access potential perches, potted plants, water sources, and other lures inside and beyond the glass. The trick of transparency is exacerbated when windows are installed on opposite sides of the building directly across from one another or at the corner because birds perceive an unobstructed passageway and fly towards the glass with no awareness of the obstacle. And finally, illumination, the beacon effect is probably the most critical. The illumination of buildings at night in, and in the early morning and evening creates conditions that are particularly hazardous on nighttime migrating birds. Typically, flying at heights over 500 feet, especially if weather conditions are favorable, nocturnal migrants depend heavily on visual references to maintain orientation. During inclement weather, these migrants often descend to lower altitudes, possibly in search for clear sky celestial clues of magnetic references, and are liable to be attracted to illuminated buildings or other tall structures. Heavy moisture 
humidity fog and mist in the air greatly increases the illuminated space around buildings regardless of whether the light is generated by the interior or exterior source. Birds become disoriented and trapped while circling in an illuminated zone and are likely to succumb to exhaustion, predation, or lethal collision. And this factoid is from New York Audubon. 100 million birds are killed every year in the United States through collisions with buildings. And we're going to go into the, our, our second topic, which is the Lights Out programs. <clears throat> this is a picture of Houston at night, showing minimal amounts of lights on in uh, tall buildings. So first, you you have to know a little bit about how birds fly in in the height. The lower levels are the most hazardous areas of all buildings, especially during the day and regardless of overall height. Uh, the ground levels and bottom few stories. Here, birds are most likely to fly into glazed facades that reflect surrounding vegetation, sky, or other features attracted to birds. Moderate height. Buildings between 50 and 500 feet tall pose hazards since migrating birds descend from migrating heights in early morning to rest and forage for food. Migrants also frequently fly short distances at lower elevations in the early morning to correct the path of their migration, making moderate height buildings a prime target, especially if they have large expanses of reflective or transparent glass, or if they are highly illuminated, like most tall buildings are. The tallest Buildings, while well, the exact heights of birds' migration paths vary depending on species, geography, season, time of day, night, and weather conditions, radar tracking has determined that approximately 98% of flying vertebrates, birds and bats, migrate at heights below 500 meters or 1,640 feet during the spring, with 75% of flying below that level in the fall. Today, many of the tallest buildings in the world reach or come close to the upper limits of bird and bat migration. Storms of fog, which cause disorientation, put countless numbers of birds at risk during a single evening. Any building over 500 feet tall than approximately 40 to 50 stories is an obstacle on the path of an avian nighttime migration and must be thoughtfully designed and operated to minimize its impact. Currently, the tallest building in the world, the Bosch Khalifa, is 27 100 feet in Dubai, and the Willis Tower, for U.S. comparison, is 1,450 feet in Chicago. So if you can see my mouse, <clears throat> the Willis Tower is about the top of the shorebird migration. Light color studies on birds led to the development of the Phillips clear sky bulb, which produces white light with minimal red wavelengths which are dangerously attractive to birds, and is now used in Europe on oil rigs and some electrical plants. Tests with this bulb on an oil platform during the 2007 fall migration produced a 50 to 90 percent reduction in birds circling and landing. It has been demonstrated that mort mortality at the communication towers were greatly reduced if strobe lighting was used as opposed to steady burning light, or especially red lights. Replacement of steady burning warning lights <coughs> excuse me, when intermittent lights at locations causing collisions is an excellent option for protecting birds as is manipulating light color. So as we can see from this slide, the red zone down over here <coughs> is the most attractive to birds, so they're going to uh, fly into these towers, <coughs> especially during overcast skies. And green and blue light are less attractive and minimally dis disorienting to birds. In 1997, FLAP, which stands for Fatal Light Awareness Program, uh, was developed, which successfully encouraged 16 major downtown buildings to extinguish unnecessary interior and exterior lighting after midnight during migration seasons. This is in uh, the city of Toronto. The program has reduced nighttime light emission and bird mortality throughout the downtown. Eliminating the floodlighting of the CN Tower, for example, virtually eradicated bird mentality at that site. FLAP estimates that participation of all 16 buildings in the bird-friendly building program saves 3.2 million 
dollars in energy costs, the equivalent reduction of 38,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions. For most participants, this bottom line cost savings is justification alone to reduce or eliminate nighttime lighting. And it's probably the reason why tall building owners are usually amendable to joining uh, lights out programs because of the energy savings. Here's a good example on the, the left side. You'll see the, the, this beacon effect with birds would be attracted to. And on the right side, it's more muted and probably less desirable for birds to uh, approach. Chicago is the first U.S. city to dim all to, to dim tall building lights to save birds' lives. Through the Lights Out program, Chicago's tall buildings over 40 stories, <coughs> currently 30 buildings participating, have all turned off their decorative lights during spring and fall migration, putting them in the forefront of American cities taking action to help birds. In a great display of civic concern and responsibility, all buildings cooperate with the program by dimming their decorative lights for almost five months of the year, making lights out a real success. Field Museum researchers estimate the program saves the lives of more than 10,000 mig migratory land birds each year. <coughs> so Mark asked whether the robins and seagulls was affected um, by uh, buildings in their lights on. And that's probably not true because uh, they tend to be resident birds. <coughs> it's the migrating birds that are affected, and particularly the songbirds, as you can see here. The songbirds are in the top of this list. <coughs> White throated sparrows, oven birds, and common yellow sorts are repeatedly amongst the top ten uh, lists. So New York City. Uh, goes around and collects dead birds uh, to, uh, as part of their monitoring program to see how many birds are actually dead. Growing awareness of lights fail attraction to birds has led to action. The actually Audubon inaugurated Lights Out New York in 2005. A number of city iconic buildings such as the Chrysler Building, Rockefeller Center, 501 Lexington Ave, Silverstein Properties, the Time Warner Center, and Worldwide Plaza will turn off their lights from midnight to dawn during peak run migration seasons from September 1st to November 1st. And more at home for me, the Lights Out Boston program that started in 2008. <coughs> Here are some of the particulars. Uh, there are 46 participating buildings to date. It includes the John Hancock Tower, the Prudential Tower, and the World Trade Center and International Place. <coughs> what it requires is a dim and extinguish internal lighting and extinguish decorative architectural lighting between 11 and 5. And the light cell dates are generally during migration, March 1st to June 1st, and then fall migrations, August 15th to August 31st. Excuse me, October 31st. Again, saves energy, reduce heat trapping gases that contribute to climate change, so that's going to reduce the urban heat island effect in cities, and it saves the building on this money electricity costs. <coughs> and the light cell program is now expanded across the U.S. So there are light cell programs on the West Coast and, and Texas, uh, a lot in the Midwest. <coughs> There's at least one location in Minnesota that is a state ordinance for light cell programs. And it, uh, out of all the design criteria you can do, having a light cell program is number one before the glass or, or general bird safety design. Now here's a good picture of the beacon effect. This is a tribute, uh, tribute in light spots at the Ground Zero Memorial on September 11, 2004. And it shows all these birds flying around here. And they're, they're not migrating. They're just attracted to that light and uh, totally dazed. So you can imagine during migration what would happen. <clears throat> and on the right side, the red-tailed hawk probably thinks he sees another hawk. And so is trying to attack it on the right side.
And so now we're going to get into the bird collision deterrence uh, lead pilot credit. And pilot meaning that it's not an official credit yet, but you can elect to, to uh, attempt it, and they will give you the point. Um, but probably in version 4, uh, this will be a, a, a bona fide credit. And as we see, uh, it's pretty comp comprehensive. Now, uh, it covers all of the rating systems through construction, core and shell, schools, healthcare. But we're going to focus on two new construction existing buildings. And uh, a quick visual explanation of the credit, the way it works is you have to have a safe building facade to all bird-friendly glass, or you have to meet a bird collision threat rating on the glass. And we'll go into detail on that. Second criteria is interior lighting is shut off by nighttime personnel or automatic shut off. And that that would be similar to a lights out program. Same with number three requirements, uh, fixture shielding and meeting the new construction SSC8 or the light pollution reduction requirements. As we all know, it's a very difficult credit to achieve. And finally, create a building facade monitoring plan to see if, if the design is actually working, see how many dead, dead birds are around your building uh, a after uh, bad weather and during migration season. So the, the first requirement, building facade requirements. Yeah, there's this new term called the threat factor. <clears throat> it has to be 15 or less. So opaque material is zero. That's the lowest. And 100 would be clear glass. So then there's all these multiple options in between uh, plexiglass with black filament is nine. A glass with white ceramic fritting is with 40% coverage is 24. And uh, frit with 20% coverage is 41 which is halfway between uh, the requirements here of 0 to 100. So here's one example of the glass with black filament. <clears throat> this picture is actually not a building. This is a, uh, a sound attenuation wall. But as you can see, those black lines are very visible. But it gives you a threat factor of 9, which would qualify for the lead credit. <clears throat> and here's all the criteria. And uh, points about the glass are met references lead green building rating systems, uh, UV absorbing, um, a few references in New York City Audubon, City of Toronto bird friendly design guidelines. The next example would be silk screen white ceramic fritting. And the fritting usually is on the inside, which is not as good as having it on the outside. <clears throat> but usually that's where you find it. And the two examples that I gave here with the threat factor is the 20% dots is, uh, gives you a 41, which is only halfway in the, the lead standard. And if you have a 40% coverage, you get a threat factor of 24. So even though you would do this, it's not uh, would not meet the lead standard. And the, the latest technology in bird-friendly glass is this Ornolux UV reflective lines in, re in regular patterns. <coughs> the Ornolux was inspired by how spiders use UV reflectance in their webs so birds will not fly through them. In the understanding that birds are able to see light in the ultraviolet spectrum, utilizing the principles of biomimicry. So as you can see, birds can see this um, fritting in the glass, but we don't. So we would see this, as you can see my pointer, and the birds would see this and would not fly into the glass. So it, it's highly effective. Although we only get a, a threat factor of 34, which would not qualify for lead. <coughs> Here's another view of that same glass um, shown from a distance. So if you were look, looking head-on, you probably wouldn't see any of those uh, 
legible lines, but the birds can certainly see them and will avoid them. And here's a calculator, and I just show this as an example. Uh, this is the John Hancock building in Boston. It was an easy building to uh, show as a, an example. It's 60 stories of straight reflective glass. Uh, building height is 790 feet. Uh, the total facade is 966,000 square feet. And they, they break it down to two zones. The first zone is the first three stories and any story above a, a um, green roof. And the rest of the building would fit into zone two. And just a, as a exercise, I'm just showing this uh, these calculations. You would put in the area of the glass for the first three stories, and this is the black mullions, it would be opaque. On this side would be the rest of the uh, 57 stories. would be here, and, and this is the black uh, mullions here. And as you can see, it only gives a bird safety factor of 86, which is pretty bad. So most likely during a storm and migration, a lot of birds are going to be hitting John Hickok Tower. And the reason why we don't often see these dead birds is that the maintenance crew usually pick them up in the morning so they're not seen. And another example using the Prudential Center here in Boston. And this time I replaced, this is hypothetical, this is not, not a real project, using the or Ornolux Makito glass. And the Prudential Tower is about 52 stories. Building height is 750 feet. And here's the breakdown, zone one and zone two. <clears throat> it's about 50% glass and 50% opaque. So th these numbers go here. And the threat factor is 34 for this particular Ornolux glass. And all the glass above the third story would be this area right here with the same threat factor. So even if the Prudential Center were to replace all its glass with this uh, high-tech bird legible glass design, you would only get a 17 and you need a 15. So you wouldn't get the point. So at this point, the credit is definitely not an uh, easy credit to achieve. <clears throat> Some bird trap, um, they, they mentioned the, the areas for the first three stories in green roofs are um, considered high threat. And this is why when you have a green roof or setbacks, this attracts birds. And then they fly into the glass just beyond here. You can see my mouse. And in atriums, uh, if you design atriums with um, bird-friendly or, or trees that supply food to birds, and then you have this highly reflective glass on their done eating and they fly out. Uh, <clears throat> this particular library in Austin, uh, Massachusetts, has a lot of dead birds on, on the perimeter because they don't see that glass. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a few other examples. <clears throat> Hall's dormitory at MIT. <clears throat> These high uh, or deep recesses help um, the problem of bird collisions because you can't really see that glass unless you're straight on. And the, <clears throat> it gives plenty of opportunity for the birds to, to recognize that there's a, a um, opaque surface there. <clears throat> Same with studio gangs, uh, Aqua Tower. It not only has balconies, but it also has bird-friendly glass as well. Uh, but again, the birds can see this waviness, and it's, it's very um, visible to them as opposed to transparent, all transparent glass. A few other examples, Gary's uh, IAC headquarters has very dense fretted glass, <clears throat> so it hardly appears as glass, so birds are not likely to fly into that. And also here in Boston, the Pianos Garden and Museum Extension has this balustrade in the front, and it does not use a reflective uh, material. This is actually opaque material in the background. The second requirement, interior lighting requirements, uh, nighttime personnel have to turn out lights or automatic shut off. Uh, develop a lighting design strategy to effectively eliminate or reduce light trespass from the building. 
the lighting in all spaces with a direct line of sight to exterior fenestration shall meet at least one or two of these options. Develop a lighting design strategy to effectively reduce and eliminate light trespass from exterior fixtures. Meet the exterior and garage lighting power density and control requirements in ASHRAE standard 90.1-2010. Or meet the LEED SS8 credit light pollution reduction to minimize the light trespass in the building and site. Reduce sky glow to increase night sky access. Improve nighttime visibility through glare reduction. And reduce development impact on lighting in nocturnal environments. And here are a few examples of uh, uh, fixture shielding. This here is a project that I'm doing in Norwood, Massachusetts, but uh, the full cutoff lights. <coughs> and the same with uh, wall-mounted sconces can be full cutoff. On the right here is uh, an example of uh, acceptable and unacceptable light fixtures. And this was sponsored by the International Dark Sky Association, which has similar uh, interest is uh, bird-friendly design to preserve and protect the nighttime environment in our heritage of dark skies through environmentally responsible outdoor lighting. And finally, the last requirement is post-construction monitoring plan requirements. Imi implement the facade monitoring plan for a period of three years. If the result of the monitoring plan indicate any areas of the building receive multiple collisions, consider implementing temporary or not permanent retrofits to the building facade. And we're going to get into some of those options in a minute. <coughs> so this is the other rating system we're going to explore here at the existing buildings, EB, and how you can make your you're building bird friendly on existing glass. <clears throat> it has similar requirements to new construction, except with the retrofit of uh, existing glass option. So as the visual explanations show here, the first requirement is to create a building facade monitoring plan. <clears throat> and that would include interior lighting shut off uh, by nighttime personnel and autom autom automatic shut off, and exterior lighting, fixture shielding, or use the lead credit light pollution reduction requirements. And on the right side, performance and implement the building facade wiring plan performance period for three years. <coughs> the monitoring plan is important because if, if it shows that there's a lot of bird fatalities, then you have to come up with a corrective action plan. And here's some examples of corrective action. Adhesive films for glass retrofit. Uh, this one on the left here, the decals used to be used, but they now know that they're not effective. Uh, the space in between the decals, the birds will fly into. If they don't see the space, they only see the decal space. For home use, you have this Scotch Magic 810 vertical strips and sliding tape. It has a threat factor of 34. And these threat factors, by the way, are not given by the manufacturer. They're not up to date on this yet. You have to go to um, a resource from me to look up the uh, threat factor numbers. And then on the right side, 3M makes a Scotch Cal um, tape that has a threat factor also for 34. It still will not meet the credit, but it is going to reduce the amount of bird strikes. So, Richard, the threat factor lower is better. That's right, yeah. Ultimately, you want zero. But and and by who the would take three minimum years to, to get that credit in Lee DB? <laughs> well, that would depend on the uh, the monitoring uh, program. Okay. Um, you know, as you know, LEED is on, is on the honor system, so if you're you're monitoring your building for three years and you find a lot of bird strikes, then you should um, do a corrective action uh, using one of these uh, options for um, making the glass visible. Thanks. <clears throat> so that the, the rule is a two by four. And as you can see, the swallow can fly sideways if it wants to. 
So a simple decal is not enough to uh, prevent bird strikes. It has to be uh, fretting or striping a minimum of uh, two inches by four inches in the area. <coughs> as shown in the middle example here and on the uh, right side example here. The second requirement for EB is interior lighting requirements uh, very similar to new construction. Uh, nighttime personnel have to put out the lights or there would be an automatic shutoff and that, that would be similar to the lights out program. Uh, develop a lighting design strategy to effectively eliminate or reduce light trespass in the building. The lighting in all spaces with a direct line of sight to exterior fenestration shall meet at least one of two of these two options shown here on the screen. The uh, third requirement is the exterior lighting requirements. This is very similar. <coughs> uh, fixture shielding and automatic shutoff being the first option. The second one, uh, adhering to the LEED SSA credit light pollution reduction. And that concludes the um, presentation. Uh, as a quick uh, review of the learning objectives, uh, why birds don't see glass reflection, mirror effect, uh, transparency, fly-through effect, and Lastly, the beacon effect, attraction to night light. Why on the lights out program, so lights out from 11 to 5 from March to May and August to October, <clears throat> save the most birds and save uh, the, the most money. And leave requirements for bird collision deterrence, bird friendly glass with a threat factor of less than 15. As you can see, it's not an easy accomplishment, but uh, it, this is leaders. Um, making the bar very high here. It has to be a, less, a threat factor less than 15 overall. Shut off interior lighting at night, fixture shielding and automatic shut off for exterior lighting, and creating a building facade monitoring plan to confirm that your design is actually working. So my, are there any questions out on the... Richard, I, I have one. Um, so the threat factor, did it take the non-migratory birds into consideration or is um, so in other words that example you you saw of a courtyard <laughs> with a fruit tree I mean that's not a migrating bird but there's if the um, if the remediation was taken there I guess it would help uh, absolutely um, the these design requirements are both for migratory and non-migratory those were cedar waxlings in that Austin library and they're little local uh, birds so they're, they're not migrating but they were definitely attracted to those surface berry trees. So if the glass behind the trees are, are going to be reflective, and once they leave the tree and they fly into it, it, it will kill both migratory and local birds. Would you see any uh, potential connection with the uh, lead energy credits? I mean, if you're agreeing to uh, mm -hmm. shut off your lights for a certain period of time, you might have better energy performance for your whole building. Well, that's a very good point, Mark. Uh, no one's ever asked me that. What are they? They incorporate that into the energy model. It probably would be uh, a a quite a savings if they're showing that uh, out of four months out of the year they have the lights off at nighttime. So, and yeah, that that could be a potential for energy savings and improvement on the energy model. I mean, the the again, the benefit to the owner is there. They're saving money. They don't feel the obligation to keep their, you know, the uh, lights on for status. That's right, because everyone else is uh, participating, so there's no competition. So yeah, it works um, both ways. And so you, this is uh, for 3.0. This is a pilot credit. Right now, it's pilot. Yeah, you can elect to choose it, and they will grant you the point if you make that the threat factor less than 15. I'm sure when version 4 rolls out that it will be a bona fide credit. Um, yeah, I always thought putting the uh, bird de decals uh, on the windows helped. Sorry you burst that bubble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. 
there have been a lot of um, building types like zoos and visitor centers that have found that it doesn't work. They, they just try to fly in between those decals. And inside, a, um, we've done some botanical gardens where there are birds, and they actually oh, put up a uh, yeah. safety net yeah. inside the building so the birds don't hit the glass. That's right. That, that's another option, uh, not a like, uh, likely one for buildings, but certainly for um, botanical gardens that you actually put a, a, a netting in front of the glass so they don't fly into it. Well, that's, and again, that's done because the birds are... Uh, are rare and hard mm -hmm. to capture and sometimes endangered and it, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, zoos and other type uh, animal friendly buildings will uh, seriously consider uh, bird legible design glass in their um, buildings because it's critical to them that they don't uh, um, kill birds when they're trying to uh, uh, promote uh, animals in nature. So, Matt, are there other questions out there? On the there, there is one here from Robert. Okay, go ahead. Um, could you please review bars or a grill in front of glass? How much coverage uh, must be provided in order to be considered effective, and does it qualify for lead? Bars or grills? I yeah, thought you like said that if the glass was 85% obscured with uh, could be a grill, that that would comply? Uh, in that sense, yes, but that would be a very tight grill. But sure, I want to go back to the uh, fitting one. That would be very tight. <clears throat> now here you see some examples with the 20% coverage, you only get a threat factor of 41. A 40% coverage of dots, you have a threat factor of 24. I, I don't know if they they actually measure bars or grills. Okay, you're talking about in front of the glass, is that the question? If you put uh, this in front of the glass? I think it could be that, or I think it could even be just like the, the like what you have above it with the line series. Mm. Like seeing that as like a grill of like tape or coverage. Um, Robert, if I'm getting this wrong from your assumption, please feel free to clarify in the text box for us. Well, and Richard, also, when you did the calculation for the uh, the um, uh, the Hancock, Hancock Tower, you took yeah. a deduction for the mullions. Oh, yeah, right, because that's opaque, so all the mullions don't count, although it's very little, because it's... M well, they're not, I mean, they're not even million. I don't... Well, yeah. right, they, they are very small. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a very minor percentage of the overall glass. <clears throat> so, yeah, if that person wants to email me, I'll, I'll give them the reference to the, um, the lead pilot credit, and, and there's a, um, a the third factor table, and you can go through that. But I don't remember seeing anything of that nature. Of uh, I understand there's some movement with the utility companies that have the um, uh, the tall towers that. Um, when they are replacing bulbs, they're, they're staying away from the red, but they're not going to go up until the bulbs need replacing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and that uh, certainly helps um, during migratory periods because the, the red definitely attracts uh, birds. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, we, got just a more, we got just a little more clarification from Robert. Go ahead. Uh, I think you kind of already addressed it. He was thinking something along the lines of like a sunshade, or a terracotta uh, baguette shape or something in front of the glass, but like you said, it sounds like that just isn't fully effective by itself. No, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think oh, a sunshade shade would qualify. Terracotta baguettes I've seen like over at the, uh, across from the Harvard uh, Design School, um, it doesn't cover 50% of the glass. I mean, um, so I guess it wouldn't credit, it wouldn't qualify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is this, again, in front of the glass or? It's outside the building in front of the glass. Yeah. And um, a double facade, um, I wonder if that would create a, f a reflection that a bird would see, or maybe not. Well, if it did both uh, facades are transparent glass, probably not, because uh, uh, don't forget the light from the inside uh, reflects outside, and that's what attracts the birds. Why did you say that Renzo Piano facade at the museum was okay? 
Uh, because he doesn't have any glass. I thought it, I thought isn't that glass? No, it's not glass. That that's a um, a metallic uh, material that you're looking at. There is glass in the doorways, but not uh, on the. That's actually a screen. That's a screen, yeah, yeah. And then they're not going to be attracted to that. And although he has trees in the foreground, he don't doesn't have vegetation up against the building that's going to attract the birds to to fly into it. You know, it's a relatively safe. I don't think piano designed it for birds, but it's just um, an example of a building that will not have a lot of bird collision. And the same with the Gary uh, IAC headquarters. Okay, are there any other questions, Matt? We're, we got about 12 minutes, but... I don't have anything else at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mark, you want to um, reiterate again our next webinar coming up in January? Sure. There's um, there are a growing number of uh, the presentation next month um, is by Useful VS, and there's a growing number of people in building product manufacturers um, who are concerned that uh, LEED and other rating programs are you know creating credits based on um, uh, less than scientific evidence, um, and and asking manufacturers to take chemicals out of their products that that this particular group doesn't like, um, and so I think he's he's uh, um, just trying to be a um, sort of counterpoint or a, a voice of reason in in uh, sustainability that's uh, with it, with documented science behind it. And um, he's an excellent speaker. He's very thoughtful. He's taught at the University of, um, I, at IIT, I believe. He's, um, um, and he's very involved with the real estate community um, who are responding to the um, different rating systems. And as you know, a number of the big uh, realty companies, holding companies, uh, have their own sustainability program rather than LEED. And it's, it's based on uh, different criteria and often is, is based on things that also save the, um, the owner money or operating costs. So um, I, I, I think it'll be good to, to look at sustainability beyond LEED. And uh, Yusval is the, uh, is, uh, I think his presentation will address that very, very well. I would really encourage uh, people to uh, put this one on their calendar for um, uh, January 15th. 15th, uh, it is from 3 to 4. Yep. Okay, very well. And that is up on the line, too, if you wanted to look at it for more um, details. You know, people are also welcome to suggest, who are listening in, to suggest uh, topics. In the past, we've done uh, hour-long topics. We've done 20-minute-long topics. So if you have something that you've done some research on or some lessons learned, uh, it'd be great if you want to uh, share it with the group. Yes, please do. So with that, Matt, if there's no more other questions, we can sign off a little early today. I right, thank everyone for uh, joining me today. Already, there's a question I have here from Robert. Oh, go ahead. Um, if you do have any more information that would indicate high-performance glass uh, that includes silver material, such as a PPG Solibon 72XL, um, is more dangerous to birds due to higher reflectivity than a clear glass uh, without performing coating. Okay. I guess it's a matter of whether or not a glass that has a reflective coating is actually worse or better than regular glass. Oh, it's going to be bad. Yeah, reflective glass is bad. Right, but, yeah. you know, you have competing interests here. Once you get past that threat factor of uh, 15, whether you're using solar band 60 or 70 or 72, mm -hmm. um, you're saving energy, you're potentially increasing the comfort of the people in the buildings, mm -hmm. and, and none of them work for birds. So yeah. um, it uh, it's not a matter of degrees. Um, from a bird point of view, so it's at that point it's about the uh, uh, energy use and the comfort of people in in the building. So, mm -hmm. I think they, if I understand the the question correctly, um, 
my interpretation that something with a threat factor of 60 or 70 is still a threat factor and, and so move to other criteria. And I would agree with you there, Mark. And in those situations, uh, if the, the glass facade is uh, helping the energy savings, then you want to uh, promote the lights out program in that building. I suppose there's always the potential that the migratory path is in the same direction each year. Um, I don't know enough to ba about it to um, maybe a building isn't big enough so that you could like treat the east and west and ignore the north and south. <laughs> well, that, um, to answer your former question, it, it changes depending on the migration period. In the fall, they fly in one direction, and in the spring, in another. Um, but I haven't seen that, and the lead credit doesn't uh, control the facade that you're putting the glass on. It's uh, all around. So, <clears throat> especially if the bird is being attracted to the building because of the beacon effect, they're going to fly into any facade. Yeah, and I, I believe the wind turbine people have done some studies about size of blade, speed of blade, coating on blades mm -hmm. as to whether the birds uh, get hit flying through the, mm -hmm. the blades and um, they just get hit because they don't see them. Right, right. And it's usually at nighttime and it's, there's a lot of mist in the air and they just don't see them. <clears throat> I don't think there's an audible, um, I don't think birds uh, are deterred by audible alarms that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank uh, you again, Richard, and, sure. and thanks uh, very much for those of you who uh, are listening in. Okay. Thank you. We'll see you next month.